has the label. Only the first thousand had that. Mixtapes back then was uh, originally before that was like just uh, making tapes for people around the neighborhood and selling mixtapes. They're really, uh, I don't know when the retail outlet really started originally. They're like around where I was at. They didn't sell mixtapes until like 90s, mid 90s in the record stores. Um, Beneath the Surface just came at a time when, um, let's see how I can explain this. There was a lot of independent music being made. Um, a lot of independent records. It was kind of like a whole new movement around the late 90s that was uh, different. Like it wasn't like a lot of mixtapes that were coming out had the hits, had, you know, they were, they were either, you know, some would be reggae based, you know, but I felt like there wasn't an independent tape that was just pretty much all independent artists to kind of represent this movement from like records from everywhere, like records from the West Coast, records from the Midwest, records from the East Coast, and kind of putting all these 12 inches on a tape. Because it kind of reminded me of before with mixtapes where you couldn't get the albums because the albums were, there were no albums. It was only on vinyl, there were only 12 inches. So the way you would, people would come and be like, hey man, can you make me a tape? Because it was all 12 inch based and people couldn't play 12 inches in their car or on their boom boxes. So you would create these tapes and sell them around the neighborhood. And it was kind of the same thing because a lot of this at this time was pretty much single 12 inch based. People were just starting to get albums together independently, you know? Mixtape DJ inspirations, uh, all the beat junkies, uh, the Babu tapes, the J Rock tapes, the Repmatic tapes, uh, DJ Rob One, a lot of classic mixtapes. I still have all of those. Uh, Rick Record Fiends from the New England area. Um, New York was probably Tony Touch, um, Spin Bad. Oh, and um, Rock Raider has some really good tapes, too. Those are probably the main ones in Chicago. You know, Mo Men, Cash Money Brothers, G-Most are probably the main ones. Bam! In your face! Digging for samples or digging for different things for songs and just trying to find new things that were related to the theme of the tape but also in relation to specific songs or artists and how to like interlude things together so like because a lot of the Chicago based stuff using snippets from Cooley High but then bringing it into a National Lampoon's record or something like that like intertwining different things kind of making some things like there's parts that uh, talk to each other where it's like different movies, you know, and just all the different movies from Chicago. There's a lot of different movies from Chicago. Like, what was that one? Um, the Train one. That had the dude that did the voice of Hong Kong Fui. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's like, and then just like intertwine that from a train thing to, I think, like Stony Island. I can't remember, man. But like just intertwining different movies and... Yeah, it's funny because a lot of it was on VHS and, um, you know, different records, just different things, like making different things work with each other so that it wasn't just a mixed tape, you know, where it wasn't just song, 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 but, you know, filling all the gaps, you know, I always did that, I always, even going way back, I always, I don't know, I filled the space, like, even if it was little things like, a bridge in a song, I would fill the space with something. Even if it was lightly panned to one side or something, there would always be something going on and it would always have to relate to the next thing going on. This was like 98. So I had just, uh, I mean, I had worked with a bunch of different DJs like doing promotions and stuff like that. So I had different connections for distribution. And at that time, I used to sell a lot of people's tapes. Like I would sell Rob One tapes. In Chicago, I would sell um, the Beat Junkies tapes in Chicago. 
I would sell uh, Eclipses tapes. So like, and Baby G, he was in uh, Dallas. So I would sell these guys' tapes in Chicago and get them into independent stores, which like a lot of it was, Gramophone was probably the, the biggest carrier of the tapes. And then they would do the same for me. So like when I put out this tape, I would send them to Eclipse and he would sell them at Fat Beats and Baby G would sell them down in Texas and you know, Rob One would help me out in LA. And then I had retail accounts that I had worked with. So I would go through those channels and just consignment. Some wouldn't be consignment and I would put it out that way. Got some over to Europe. Um, I mean, pretty much like it was like an underground distribution network of mixtapes. It was kind of the beginning of, uh, I don't know if anybody really had online stores then, but people talked about it on message boards and stuff at the time. But like it was all, I mean, I would get letters with checks to like the P.O. box or whatever and mail out a cassette to somebody, you know. Um, but yeah, and that that's, it just spread that way, you know. Probably sold you know, somewhere between two and three thousand of them all duped on multiple cassette decks, you know, going out to the suburbs to buy blank tapes and labels and then printing the J cards at Kinko's, cutting them up at Kinko's. <laughs> but yeah, it was probably two, three thousand of them and then I started selling them on tour too, so I don't even know how many ended up selling. Originally, I was like, hitting up some different graph writers and stuff and everybody was kind of busy doing their thing so I used to write I mean it's not the best thing I did but I just sat up with a sharpie one day and just kind of drew this up and I mean it was like the whole concept was you know being beneath the surface like all these good records were coming out and they were uh, like a lot of people weren't hearing about them there was like a scene happening so it was kind of like just some letters. I remember a kid did diss me on a message board, told me my style was whack <laughs> on it. But I kind of just put the letters together with the crates of records underneath and real old school. And that was kind of like the concept of it was kind of going back to like the old DJ flyers and how they be <laughs> handwritten and hand drawn. And that was kind of uh, what it was. Like I kind of like freestyled it, like these letters and stuff. I never really even did these letters. I don't know what I was really thinking. And then the rest was just kind of uh, done on like Microsoft Word or something to kind of put the playlist in it. I also did a weird thing which I was going to try to remember, but I underlined a letter on like each song and group going through this whole thing. And it says something when you work out all the letters. And this kid from Atlanta, I didn't think anybody would figure out. That was just me being a nerd and seeing if anybody would catch it. But this kid from Atlanta it hit me up on a one of the old message boards, it was probably the Rhyme Sayers board, and, and told me that he figured it out, what it said, but I don't remember what it said, so you'll have to figure it out yourself. But I basically underlined everything for like, kind of like a message, you know? And I also like, with the artwork, made it a point with each song to give credit to the DJs for each song, because a lot of times, like, you know, it would just say the artist and it wouldn't say the DJ. So like, uh, I. Man, my girlfriend would diss me on this because I think it's in Comic Sans. Mike 2600 would not be proud right now. But uh, it says, uh, in respect to the artists played on this tape, I've listed above all whom deserve credit and have earned it. Notice I've given credit to all the DJs whom put their talent to the wax and their cuts to history. You must always remember the DJ. I actually, like, I started to finish it and then I started touring with Atmosphere, and then it was like, you know, six months on the road, and I never went back to finishing it. But the whole thing was, the beneath the surface, this was yellow. The break the surface was green, like grass. And then it was going to be beyond the surface, which was blue. And the whole concept was, this is underground, like people don't know what this is. And it's, it was really starting to spread. Then when break the surface came out, there was a scene and people were touring and it was really starting to spread and then beyond the surface was going to be like you know the breakthrough of everybody and people had albums then and stuff you know it wasn't so much 12 inch based and 
and things. And that was the whole concept that it would be a beneath break beyond the surface trilogy that never was finished, unfortunately, and probably never will be. Well, you know, originally this, I was only going to do one side of this tape. <laughs> and Spontaneous was going to do the other side of this tape. And it never got worked out. And then, uh, so I went back and actually then I recorded my side and then the tape player messed up and lost everything because we were recording straight to uh, cassette <laughs> on uh, what was the board? It was this Task Game 688 track. Yeah. So we were recording and it, it basically, the board broke, we brought it in to get fixed and when it came back it didn't play the tape the same. So I started over and then that's when it kind of became, that's when it kind of became what it was going to be a trilogy and doing both sides and um, so the, the, that stands out because it was a lot of work to get done. It was basically, let me make this mix. Okay, I'm not just doing one side. Because I, I always looked at things as an A and a B side, and they had to have meaning. So the way one side stops will continue on the next side. And uh, trying to uh, do that when I was doing one side and another DJ was doing another side, and then that fell apart. So going back and then starting it, and then that fell apart. So it was kind of like a mission to get this tape done. Oh, one thing that happened was I found this uh, that nas a National Lampoon record that had all these uh, bird things on it that I just happened to find when I was record shopping, when I was working on it. And then a lot of the interludes just kind of came out of that record. Um, there was like last minute stuff too. Um, finding just like happened that Birdman just started popping up on uh, was it Adult Slim then or was it Cartoon Network or something so like I was taping all these Birdman episodes and pulling dialogue and stuff from it you know so some of the stuff just kind of uh, happened like <laughs> one thing that kind of happened that was interesting is that I called Rob one up and asked him for a drop I'm like can you give me a drop man and he left me this long, long message on my, my voicemail. So I kind of have Rob One going through the whole tape. Like I kind of took his drop and split it up and made interludes. And Rob just kind of pops up throughout the whole tape, which is kind of interesting. It kind of bugs me out when I was listening to this not that long ago, just tripping on that. Um, yeah. Endless question. <laughs> Bam! Beat the Service also originally had a Jaybird rap song. Can you please rap the lyrics to Beat the Service for us? There was not a rap song on it. Was it? I mean, you had a song we're gonna do over, over a Dibs beat. You remember the Beat the Surface rap song? <laughs> over a Dibs beat? Over one of his breakbeat records, yeah. And it had to cut Beat the Surface from uh, Lady of Rage. Beneath the Surface. Do you beat the Surface? Yeah. Do you remember any of the lyrics? I'm recording about that. <laughs> it better not pop up on this shit. 